Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. I promise you that you're going to hear at least one thing tonight you've not heard before. And what the, sh the material I share with you is really about self-preservation. We are people who live in bodies, and we are unfortunately in a society that sort of leads us to believe that we're all about our head and, you know, our mind and our thinking and what goes on in the rest of our body, you know, doesn't really matter. And the fact of the matter is, it's sort of an owner's manual to attachment, to re relationships. It's an important piece of, of information. Now, you're probably wondering how it is that I came to do this, because if I work in the field of post-abortion aftermath, why am I talking about the biology of, of sex and bonding? Well, it came about... Oh, good. Perfect. Um, I came upon this because um, I had this weird experience. And my weird experience was that when I had our fourth daughter, our fourth child, I met a woman who lived near us. And we became very good friends. She just had her fourth child, too, and we walked our kids to school, and we babysat for each other. And when we had our fifth kids, they were due um, within a month of each other. Not anything all that interesting. But when we had our sixth kids, they were due the same day. And I thought that was weird. And we were both on a, on a parish council um, event, and, and I said to the rest of the people, well, the March meeting is going to have to be at St. Mary's Hospital because Joan and I are going to be there. And they all smiled sweetly and, you know, look at the two crazy women with pregnancy brain. And here's how it really played. I went to the hospital at midnight on the 23rd, and my daughter Miriam was born at 7 a.m. on the morning of the 24th. Before she was born, Joan was there, and Joan was in labor. And John's birthday is on the 25th, because he took a nap, but they're born within 24 hours of each other. I thought that was weird. I had no explanation for it. You know, you tuck it in the back of your head. And I had, <clears throat> excuse me, gone uh, to a conference sponsored by a group called the Association of Pre- and Perinatal Psychology and Health. And I went to try and figure out how to help women who'd had abortions to be able to bond better in the next pregnancy. That can be a really difficult experience for them. And I'm at the conference, and on the way home, I'm reading a book called The Anthropology of Mothering by Sarah Hurdy, spelled H-R-D-Y. And she explained what happened. And she explained how it is that women who spend time together cycle together, and why it is, and why it is that women who <laughs> together also would do this. It was, like, mind-blowing. and. That got me started in the material I'm going to talk about tonight. And the more I learned, the more annoyed I got because no, I'd never heard this stuff before. And I started telling other people about it. And in particular, I started telling the young women who call our office who'd had abortions who said, you know, I, I only had sex once. I'm not even supposed to be able to get pregnant the first time I have sex. And I was able to explain to her why it had happened. And these young women started saying to me, promise me that you'll tell other people this. I wish I'd known this material because I might not be in the place I'm in now. And so that, I'm in front of you because of my promise to them, okay? This, um, this whole area just became more and more interesting to me as, as it went along. And I wanna start by talking about the fact that we are really as people far more interconnected than we know. We live in a society that has said, oh well, no big deal. You know, you, you can move from, from D.C. area to Seattle to San Diego. No big deal. Families do that, okay? But the reality is that we are far more closely linked to our family of origin than we have any idea about. And the first thing that I want to talk about is that the Chinese talk about the fact that we are more likely to get the diseases of our grandmothers, this being you, this being your mom, this being grandma, than our mothers. And the reason being that when your mother, when grandma was pregnant with your mom, only 20 weeks, so about halfway through the pregnancy, all the ovum that would become her children are already present. We as women, 20 weeks in utero, all the ovum we're ever going to have in our life are already present. First, there are six million. By the time we're born, 
we're down to about two million by the time we get our period we're down to four hundred to four hundred fifty thousand and in an average woman's life there's about four hundred to four hundred fifty periods by the way right the cells die off through a naturally occurring process that's called apoptosis and it is exactly what it sounds like it's natural cell death the cells just pop and are reabsorbed this happens in our bodies all the time you know they say our bodies replace themselves about every seven years in terms of complete cellular renewal well that's what happens okay so these the ovum that were here are now impact excuse me <coughs> impacted by what was going on in grandma's life this is an unfolding field called epigenetics and it means that the circumstances, if grandma was in high stress, if grandma was sick, that changed how the DNA of her children is being expressed. It doesn't change the DNA at all, but this information, it's, it's a process called methylation, is how this gene is going to be expressed now. And it might be different than it would have been if grandma was calm. Okay? So this connection here between grandma and mom and you is a very significant one between us and our children. There's this ongoing um, interaction, okay? Now, there's more to this, though. There is a man by the name of Brian Sykes, S-Y-K-E-S. And Sykes wrote a couple of books. He wrote more than a couple, but the two I'm going to talk about are a book called The Seven Daughters of Eve and Adam's Curse. And in The Seven Daughters of Eve, he talks about something that you may not know about. And that is that everybody in the world carries the mitochondria of their mothers. No one in the world has the mitochondria of their fathers. What are mitochondria? Those are the energy, set, the energy bodies within ourselves. And not only do you carry your mothers, you carry your mothers, 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 mothers back to seven lines of women with the implication that there might have been an Eve and that you can track your mitochondria. National Geographic would be happy to take about $100 from you. They will send you a little swab, they send them a little cheek swab, and they will tell you which of the seven lines of women your mitochondria descended from, and they will tell you what the migration pattern of those women were, was through history. It's fascinating. So Sykes was at a conference, and some guy says to him, you related to this other guy named Sykes who's speaking here? And he's like, I don't think so. I've never heard of him. But then that got him thinking about something, and what he started thinking about was, is there something else that has this kind of continuity? And indeed, there is. You women are XX. You guys are XY. Gentlemen, your Y has the same kind of continuity. Your Y is your father's, 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 father's Y. Few more subgroups, not too many, but a few. For instance, in the Jewish community, there is the tradition of the priestly caste. In fact, the members of the Jewish community who are members of the priestly caste have a special marker on the Y. Not only do you find it there, but you also find it in the Igbo tribe in Nigeria, where the tradition is that they descended from one of the tribes of Israel. And in the Lemba tribe, which is also in Africa, has the same tradition. There's a marker there, okay? So this connection about where do we come from, who are we, is really important, all right? We need to know that. You know, if any of you um, come out of, a, out of a Christian tradition, you know that there's a place in Scripture where we talk about who begat, who begat, who begat, and I always thought, who cares? Why did we waste all that papyrus, okay? <laughs> But the fact of the matter is that our maternal line is important and our paternal line is important. We need to know who we are, okay? Again, that interconnection in ways that we don't even think about. I want to say um, a little bit about men and women because the rest of the talk is going to be in terms about complementarity and who we are. But I want to say a little bit about men and women's brains, all right? We live in a society that um, really supports gender neutrality, all right? And there are people who seriously say that you men are men because your parents dressed you in blue, and you girls are girls because your parents dressed you in pink. I'm dead serious about this. I don't know, 
my kids were red and brown. I don't know what that says about them, but pink and blue weren't the colors. Um, but this awareness that if only we, we, as parents, did something, you would be lovely, gender-neutral people, okay? Now, the first thing I want to report to you is that there was an experiment done, and it was done with little, little boy and girl monkeys, and they had them in a play area, and they had a bunch of toys, and they had pink, fuzzy, cuddly toys, and they had blue boy toys, trucks, balls, and darned if the girl monkeys didn't pick the pink, fuzzy things, and the boys picked the blue balls and trucks. So apparently in the monkey community, there's also a problem with the way the parents are dressing their kids, all right? <laughs> apparently. This awareness, you know, I, when our kids were young, um, this was the big deal. So we did the proper thing, and it was if you gave your girls trucks and your boys dolls, that would help with gender neutrality. So we gave our girls, there's four of them, trucks. And they promptly wrapped them in baby blankets, and they gave them names, and they had parties and naps and fed them bottles, and nobody ever tried to take a wheel off or check to see if the doors opened, all right? Boys would have done that immediately. So that was kind of a failed experiment. <clears throat> then our two sons are eight years apart. Son number one got a doll. And um, he quickly discovered that dolls make great footballs. <laughs> and wore it out. He never named it. No blankets, no naps, no nothing. He and the kid down the block wore out the doll. Kid number two got a doll, and it was a buddy doll. And some of you might remember buddy. They're boy dolls. They've got, you know, coveralls and tools. My son liked his buddy doll. And it was only a couple of years ago that this following story unfolded. There are some things parents don't hear. We had gone to the grocery store one Saturday morning and left the older kids in charge of the younger kids. And son number one decided they should play a game. It was called Sacrifice the Buddy Doll. <laughs> it's not a girl game, okay? I said to my son, well, in midlife, when you have to go into therapy, because we all do, you have something to talk about, okay? <laughs> but the awareness that from the beginning, from the get-go, there are changes. We are different, okay? And <clears throat> the default model on babies is actually XX, girls, all right? We girls are stronger than you guys because we have two X's. And there's 3,500 to 6,000 genes on one of those. And if there's a flaw in one, you know, a, a predisposition to um, a genetic disease or something, guess what? The other one just covers, picks it up. This is why we women pass genetic diseases onto our sons. This is about color blindness and some other things, all right? So, this is the first piece, but on your why, okay, right after, birth, right after conception, there's a little marker and it's called an SRY. And the SRI kicks in and sets off your male development. Now, one of the reasons you guys are more fragile is you've got the X with the 3,500 to 6,000 genes on it, but you've got your Y. Yeah, there's only about 72 on there, all right? It, there's not the balance, okay, that's, that's the point. But this SRY is what then begins the male development. When we are first conceived, there are malarian glands and there are wolfian glands. The wolfian glands will become the male genitalia, the malarian will become the female. When this SRY kicks off, it begins to produce an anti-malarian substance that will you know, stop the growth of these other of the other genitalia and early on the chemistry is present the testosterone is there okay and so that awareness of of individual differences is important and I'm going to talk a little bit about male female brains and I want to say to you that about 60% of you guys will have a very male brain 60% of the women will have a very female brain and then there's a gradation there it doesn't mean anything other than that, than that you might think a little more in the direction of either male or female. What does that mean? Males have are linear thinkers, and I'm going to explain that to you. We women are multitaskers. So there might be some of you men who are really good multitaskers. There might be some of you women who are linear thinkers. But predominantly, this is, this is the difference, and I'll explain it to you. Okay? Now... This 
diagram was actually put together at a conference I had many years ago by a Catholic nun and a, and a male psychiatrist from Canada. They had a big argument and discussion about the difference between male and female brains over dinner. These, these diagrams predate the books about Mars and Venus and waffles and spaghetti, all right? This is a male brain. It is a series of boxes. For a man to warp his way through this, he has to go through all the boxes. All right? Men have an incredible ability to concentrate on one thing. Women, you need to know this. He can't do what we can do, which is keep many things in the, in the air at the same time. All right? Even from the time we're little, we're different. If you're in a classroom and you guys, in a sense, have been at a real disadvantage because you have been in school in girl classrooms for the most part. The girl classroom is to sit down, be quiet, follow a long list of instructions, and sit still. Boys learn better when you're fidgeting. That makes teachers crazy. Right? Why can't he sit still? Boys can only follow one instruction at a time. We give them a bunch. So in kindergarten, we do the, okay, take out your paper, your pencil and put your name at the top of the page. All the girls can do that. You boys don't get further than paper. <laughs> Airplanes, spitballs, drawing, okay? Unlimited possibilities right here. But the teacher is now going, what's wrong with him? He can't pay attention to anything. He's attention deficit disordered. No, really, he is not attention deficit disordered. He's fully attending only to one thing. So the awareness of, of difference, okay? Now, I gave a talk like this. I was out in California, and there was a principal there, a guy who runs a school, K through 12, <coughs> excuse me, um, and it's boy classrooms and girl classrooms. And he taught me something I didn't know, and I've been married to my husband a very long time. In this series of boxes, there is an empty box. And when we say to the men we love, what are you thinking about? He says, nothing. It's true. <laughs> he can think about nothing. We women can't do that, and I'll explain that to you. I did this in another college campus not long ago, and when I said that, a guy in the back row went, yes! <laughs> I don't know what that was about. Clearly it was important, all right? But this knowledge of being single-minded, why? Because you guys were hunters, and you were seafarers, and you worked in community. You guys figure out when you're about five years old who the dominant male is in your male system based on testosterone. How do you do that? You know the pushing, shoving, wrestling business? That's what you're figuring out. You're figuring out the testosterone hierarchy. And it will remain, if you live in the same community, valid till the time you're 16 or 17, once you figure it out. Why is there a testosterone hierarchy amongst men? Because you were hunters. You had to be on the same page. You had to have a leader, because if you were out in the woods trying to capture something dangerous, you could not all be off skipping through the woods on your own. Because if you were, one, you were more likely to be lunch than to bring it home. And secondly, that why? Finished. The tiger gets you, you're done, all right? But this awareness of that hierarchy. You men, if I put you outside, most of you could tell me where true north is. If I put you in a steel building, you lose the ability. It seems that men have a little, for want of a better term, chip in their brain, like birds do that migrate thousands and thousands of miles and come back. You guys have that too. Why did you need it? Because not only were you in the woods, far from home, but you were seafarers. And there were no landmarks on the ocean. You had to be able to find your way back. And that's about north, south, east, west, okay? So this awareness of the ability to be single-focused single, single focused and, and to be able to really fall in line with that. This is a woman's brain. I call it a triage brain. We women can do something you guys can't. We can keep track of the following. The cat has thrown up. Supper is burning. The toddler has gone out the door, and I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and usually we do okay with that. That's far too many things for a guy to work out. Seriously? And why was that? Because, see, we women lived in a small community with other women and the children while you guys were far afield. 
we had to be conscious of all these things going on at the same time to keep people safe. You know, mo I'll bet that most of the women in this room have never had an empty thought. Even when you wake up and you're s from sleep, your brain is, is doing this interconnection thing, okay? We women read faces really well. We read everybody's faces well. Why? Because our life depended on it. You guys read faces well, only you read guy faces really well. Women, they're only about 40% accurate in reading our face. If you're too subtle, he's not going to get it, <laughs> all right? Um, the anthropologists say that if we need to really make our point, threat to life and tears will get his attention, all right? <laughs> Signal it's important. Um, well, but see, again, guys had to be able to read men's faces because their lives depended on that. They had to be able to look at a guy and know. Men like... Um, very precise words. Why? Because it, it eased communication. We women, all right, men and women's brains are different. Men's brains are bigger, ours are a little smaller, but ours have a little more space for connection. We women have language centers all over our brain and our emotional centers sit very close to the language centers, which means we talk to process emotion. Guys, I'm explaining something really important to you now. The reason we, all right, it's because we're trying to process something. When you say to the men in your life, tell me how you feel, he can't. Why? Because first off, his language is in two very specific spots in his brain, on the left side. If he has brain damage or a stroke, he, on that side, he may not get his language back. We women, because there are language centers all over our brain, if we have a stroke, we may be more likely to recover our language because of that. But his emotions are stored in another part of the brain. He has to go think about them, retrieve them, and then he can talk to you about them, all right? We just need to understand that we're, we're very different from each other in that respect, in terms of the emotion question, all right? Now, um, we women speak about 20,000 words a day. You guys speak about seven, well, thousand. All right. You speak for information, guys, oftentimes to other males. You do not, for the most part, speak about relationships, but about things. We women speak 20,000 words, and we talk about relationships. Okay, we process stuff by talking. There's a wonderful book, series of books, actually, done by a, a couple from Australia, their last name is Pease, P-E-A-S-E, have lots of books. And they have taken the anthropology, the sociology, the biology of how we couples work and put them into wonderful bite-sized bits of information. And the Pease's say that if we're a couple and you're the guy and she wants to talk to you about something, you should ask a question. And the question is, should I listen as a guy or should I listen as a girl? Because if I'm listening as a girl, I'm listening. Now, that doesn't mean you can take a nap. You're really listening. But you don't have to provide a solution. If you're listening as a guy, you, your, your innate sense is to fix it, to come up with a solution to the problem. Well, we women get annoyed sometimes because we don't want you to fix it. We just want you to hear us. Okay? So to be able to understand that can be very valuable. All right? There are many other differences. And just to touch on some, you know, in terms of drawing, if little boys draw pictures, they draw verbs, exploding things, driving things. We girls draw nouns, words, pictures, you know, butterflies, flowers, trees, maybe some people. We use lots of colors you guys don't use. You've got about six colors that are your color preferences. You guys have far better long-distance vision than we do. You are far better night drivers because you can see a long way out there. We women have better peripheral vision, okay, so daytime stuff. We're much more conscious of the things out here. Right? Um, that piece, you know, those are important pieces to, to think about. Um, you know, it's true that for the most part, you guys are better at math. We are better at language. We get, we're much more verbal. We're much more fluent with language sooner than you are. You guys are really good at spatial stuff, all right? Even as small babies, your preference is for mobiles. 
all right? And if we turn the mobile, even as a small baby, you already know it's the same mobile. If you do that with us girls, we're like really impressed. Oh, it's all new. Oh, I haven't seen that before. The boys are like boring. You know, been there, done that. We women prefer to look at faces from the time we're itty bitty babies, okay? You guys do eye contact up until the time you're about three months and then you start to disengage from eye contact, okay? We girls, if there's a baby crying, even as babies, will we'll cry in empathy. You know, you guys are kind of like, yeah, so? Okay, what's going on? Um, you know, if you give directions, you guys usually do north, south, east, west distance. Yeah, how do we women give directions? You know the big tree down by that office building that's really tall? We make a right there, and then you go down to the gas station with the green roof, and you make a left. All by landmark. Why? Because you were on the ocean, and you were in the forest, and there were no landmarks. We were in the community. We all knew where the raspberry patch was, where the oak tree was, because we were gatherers. Okay? That's how we knew our community. We didn't go far. We didn't go outside the confines of this. All right? Now, this is also how we shop. Men shop like hunters unless they're going to the hardware store or the electronics store. <laughs> Those are fun places. They like to go there and try things. All right? But normally, if he's going to buy the shirt, he'll say, I'm going to buy the blue shirt at the store. You don't want a yellow shirt? No? You don't want to go to the other store? No. Why would I want to do that? It's hunting. I am going to get the blue shirt. I know where the blue shirt is, and I'm coming home with the blue shirt. So when we say to him, don't you want to go shopping? Uh-uh. Not unless it's the hardware store. Okay? Then you'll go shopping, but we might not want to go to the hardware store. But you see, when we shop, it's a process. Do we know what we're looking for? Not completely. You know, ah, shoes are on sale. Awesome. Blouse. I like that blouse. That's gathering behavior. We would go out into the woods and the raspberries would be ripe. The blueberries would be ripe. Okay, we didn't always know what we were going to find. We kind of knew it was berry season. That's how we women shop. All right? It's one of those perfect, perfect examples of the difference. Okay? So the point being that we're meant to be complementary. All right? One's not better than the other. We're just different. And there's different gifts here. And we need to appreciate that about each other, okay? Because it's very easy to get frustrated. We need to know, women, pay attention, if he's reading the paper or some other object, the part of his brain where hearing exists is turned off. He cannot hear you. I still do this to my poor husband. He's reading the paper. I'm going on and on about something. Did you hear me, dear? Huh? He's sitting right there. How did he not hear me? Okay. I just said, oh, okay. All right, now I heard that. <coughs> so, again, that appreciation for this ability um, to be single-minded, to be absolutely focused. You guys need to be with other guys in part because you get testosterone from being with other guys. You guys are still, are still pack-driven because when you were hunting, you were a pack. When you go to watch sports, with people, when you are on sports teams, you are still engaging in pack behavior, okay? We women are more independent than that, okay? Because we were, we were watching our kids and other things. You men literally have thicker skin across this part of your body. Think about it as a hunter, or you were at war. This is the part of your body that would be exposed. Physically, there's thicker skin there. You men, if you're under stress, stress gives you sort of a high sort of an adrenaline rush. We women, if we're stressed, our stomach is upset. We're, we're kind of uneasy about it. If men are stressed, their pain threshold goes up. If women are stressed, their pain threshold goes down. Okay? So again, the awareness of, of our differences. Okay? Now, I'm going to erase all the boards here. Now, I want to talk about the phenomena that went on with my friend and I, this menstrual synchronicity issue, long title. And it has to do with pheromones, P-H-E-R-E -E or O-M-O-N-E-S pheromones. 
Pheromones are scent molecules of affiliation. Most of us can perceive them. If I gave you three piles of t-shirts, yours, generic male, generic female, eight out of 10 of you would identify yours immediately, and seven out of 10 would differentiate male from female. We know that generic scent, and we women are described as smelling sweet, you guys are described as smelling like musk. That's why it's an aftershave. That's a distinctly male scent, okay? Pheromones are perceived not by the same sensors where perfume is perceived, but by some different ones. And there's a different nerve in your brain. It was only discovered maybe about 10 years ago. It sits in front of the perfume, the olfactory nerve. It's very tiny, it's very fragile, which is why we didn't find it. And the pheromone perceptors communicate directly with that nerve. It's called the terminal nerve or nerve zero. The receptor sites are little pits in the center of your nose, in the septum of your nose. And they communicate a lot of things, all right? In animals and people, for many years, people, I mean, researchers would say, oh, animals, butterflies, dolphins, whales, they all have pheromones, but humans don't. But the reality is, as this unfolds, is that we are also pheromone perceptive, okay? Now, we women, if we are with our baby right after it's born, if you take our baby away and blindfold us, we can find our baby by smell within 24 hours, I mean, after the baby's born. If the baby was with us and you give the baby an option on a mother's breast pad and a stranger, the baby will always turn to the mother's breast pad. She, the baby already knows the scent of mother. You men can find your babies in 24 hours, but not by scent, by the back of the feel, the feel of the back of your baby's hand, because you're more, you're more tactile than we are, okay? So this question of what's being communicated here. Now, we women get involved in this dance with each other about our periods. And this work was done by a woman by the name of Martha McClintock, who was at the University of Chicago. And she had observed that women in dorms tend to cycle together unless they're chemically contracepting. And so she was going to do this research, and then she was all set to go. She had her two groups of women. And a friend of hers said something very interesting, and it was, hey, I think that I am an alpha female. Clintock said, what the heck does that mean? She goes, well, everybody cycles with me. And my whole life, it's been the case. Well, okay, this was even better. So McClintock was able to gather pheromones, and you gather pheromones just by wearing T-shirts, for three days with no smelly anything, no perfume, nothing with scent, all right? And you can preserve them. And so she gathered alpha woman's pheromones. She had two groups of women who had never met alpha woman or each other. And <clears throat> she gave one group alpha woman's pheromones with rubbing alcohol under their nose once a day for three months and the other group got rubbing alcohol. Within three months, the women who got alpha women's pheromones were all cycling with her except chemically contracepting women. When we are chemically contracepting, our, our body thinks it's in a state of pseudo-pregnancy and it's cycling with somebody else, okay? Now, why would women cycle together? What's that about? Well, it's about the really old days when there weren't doctors and there weren't x-rays and things like that. And should I die and I had a baby, someone in my community had to be willing to take my baby and nurse it or my baby would not survive. And the reason our babies were, Jonas and my babies were born close together is that I need somebody who's got a newborn baby, the same age as mine, because newborn milk and toddler milk is different, okay? Kin are relatives by intention, so they might not be blood relatives. That's what happens in dorms. You're a group of women that are living in close proximity and you become kin to each other, all right? So this, this concept of the need for that to happen you know, there's something else that's really fascinating, and it is, there's been an ex some experiments done, and they have discovered that breast milk is an incredibly, um, an incredible substance that they really had no idea about. They discovered that if you put breast milk on cancer cells in petri dishes, breast milk will kill, on contact, 40 kinds of cancer. Contact, that apoptosis thing I talked about naturally occurring. They have isolated what the substance is and they now are using it in terms, in particular with prostate cancer. And they've discovered that if they inject it into the prostate within four days, the prostate tumor begins to shrink and shrivel and disappear. Pretty awesome, okay? 
So this awareness of how incredibly made our bodies are, all right? Now, we women have another ability based on pheromones. And it is that pheromones have to do with the first cut when we pick a partner, a male. The scent of this male communicates a lot of things to us. It's not conscious, but it's, it's body knowledge, okay? And if I am not contracepting, the type of male I'm attracted to is a male who is, is a complement to my immune system. What I'm reading is something called the MHC complex, major histocompatibility complex, and it's the immune system markers. This is the possibility of fertility, all right? If I'm chemically contracepting, I am attracted to a very different male. Now, these are classes of men. And I'm attracted to a male whose immune system is very much like my own, or my father's, or my brother's. And why is that? Because my body thinks it's pregnant, and it's looking not for a mate, but a protector. The problem with this is that the fertility possibility of fertility is significantly reduced here. And we now are in an interesting state where people in, in the ecology movement are talking about something very seriously. And it's that they believe we now have at least one generation of children, because of the pill, who are autoimmune compromised. Pill was, came on the market in 1960. We have two to three generations of people so if, if my mother was on the pill and then I was on the pill and I picked a partner in the next generation, this is a, this is a geometric progression. That's a really serious issue, all right? Um, I first read about this in a book called Beyond Choice that was written in 2004 by Alexander Sanger. And Alexander Sanger has been very involved in international Planned Parenthood. Margaret Sanger was his grandmother. First time I saw this, and he says something incredible in his book. He says that the pill is horrendously bad medicine for the human race because it has changed our parenting history and we were not told, really our reproductive history, and we were not told. This question of autoimmune compromised people. It's a serious issue. Furthermore, if this is my partner, this kind, and I go off the pill, I no longer find him attractive. He smells bad to me. It's not body odor, it's biology. I've had a lot of people say to me, you just explained what happened in my first marriage. Because now I'm looking for someone different, okay? If, I am on, if I'm on the pill and you show me pictures of men, no men present, just photos, I will choose the male who is the most high testosterone in the pictures. In part because my body thinks it's not so fertile. And I'm looking for a partner with very high virility. Women not on the pill, shown pictures, will pick a male who has plenty of testosterone, but he isn't off the chart. Anthropologists say he's a better mate. He's going to stay. This other guy is going to impregnate and is going to be unfaithful. He's going to wander, okay? Sort of a recipe for heartbreak in many respects, if you will, okay? So this question of, the, and again, this is the first cut. He smells good to me. Then you have to figure out if he's worth it, okay? Just because he smells good doesn't mean you should marry him. All right, just means he's in the, he's in the loop, all right? Um, <clears throat> but this is important for us to know that this is really a serious issue. Um, Wall Street Journal this year wrote a whole article about it called The Tricky Chemistry of, Attra of Attraction. And more and more people are writing about this, all right? We need to know these sorts of things because if we're gonna make decisions, we have to be able to recognize what's there, okay? Now, you men also perceive pheromones, but you perceive something different. You perceive fertility, okay, infertility, and pregnancy by scent, by pheromones, right? Fertility, a little bit of biology. This is a woman's cycle. It begins with our period. And the first phase is called the follicular phase. We have two ovaries that are the size of almonds, so considerably, considerably smaller than I drew. Two fallopian tubes, which interestingly don't actually touch the ovaries, are just in proximity, and our uterus and the cervix, 
all right? Now, during the follicular stage, each month we alternate sides in terms of which side will re release the ovum. There are about 10 ovum that begin to develop and something triggers one or two. It is very rare for a human being to ovulate many ovum and conceive many children naturally. As mammals, we can effectively nourish the number of children that we have nipples to do, all right? Humans have two, piggies have many, rats have many. They have litters, they can feed them. Because remember, we are still Stone Age people who are living in a high-tech world. Our bodies haven't changed much in terms of what's happening in the world around us. We all think we're high-tech people in a high-tech world. Really, we're Stone Age people in a high-tech world. And these are the things we have to be aware of, okay? So one, one ovum, one ovum will break loose. It moves here. There are little hair-like things called cilia, and they create a little vacuum. And so while the ovum is really released into our abdominal cavity, it's, it's captured and begins to move down toward the uterus, okay? When we are ovulating, all right, this being this phase, there are two things we need to know as women. One is, we are at peak sensual awareness. Our brain works better, thinking works better, smell works better, why? Because nature has one thing on her mind and it's reproduction. When I am in an ovulatory state, I'm looking for a mate. Women, as college students, graduate students, you need to know something. This is the time to do projects, because you're on top of your game. You know, when you're over here in PMS City, you can't think your way out of a plastic bag. It's not time to be doing projects, all right? Um, you know, you can't use that in a class unless the professor's sitting in here. I did do this in a college, and the professor had invited me in. And when I explained that, he went, oh, for heaven's sakes, now there's another excuse. I said, well, I'm sorry, you invited me, and you heard it, you know? Um, but the awareness that we really are, this is our peak time. Now, there's a couple other things. Women. We live in a cyclic world. If you're gonna get a vaccination, if you're gonna have surgery, do it during ovulation because your immune system is at its peak here. You do it over here, you're likely to have a complication. Nobody tells us this. You guys don't live in that kind of cyclic world. And most medical research has been done on who? Oh yeah, men, not women. There's some very interesting research on breast cancer, and they've discovered that if the woman who has breast cancer has surgery during her ovulatory cycle, it's not so likely to recur. recur. If she has it over here, it's likely to recur, all right? Just something we need to know about how our bodies work. Now, the bad news here is this. We are very conditionable when we're ovulating. This is media effects research. And what they did was they showed women who were ovulating an erotic movie. All of them had an erotic response. Other women at these other stages shown the same movie have a consistent response, which is it's a stupid, dirty movie, all right? These women shown once at any, any time in their cycle now will have an erotic response, one exposure. Again, anthropologists say this is why we have to be careful about not jumping into sexual relationships here because we are conditioned and we are hooked with one exposure. And you guys all know who follows Mr. Wrong number one, don't you? It's Mr. Wrong number two. So it's about making good decisions, okay, in terms of this. Then over here, okay, this would be what's called the luteal phase. This is when the little follicle, the little pockmark where the ovum came out of, becomes a major chemical factory. And for uh, up to 40 some days, it can produce chemistry that will keep the ovum alive, keep a fertilized baby alive, and keep it alive while the baby is down here building its placenta, because it's the baby that builds the placenta and not us women. So the chemistry of this is very interesting. Now, back to what men perceive. Men perceive by pheromone when we are ovulating. You guys have a biological response. You are more sexually interested, aroused, and potentially aggressive when you are with an ovulating woman. We women need to know that we are more interested in sex during this period of time. We dress differently. A Canadian study 
followed women, took spit samples to see where their hormones were, showed photos then, followed, took photos every day, showed them to strangers, and at a far higher rate than accident, they identified the ovulating woman. We dressed to impress, a little more makeup, here is a little better, a little more decolletage, dressed up a little more, trying to impress. Why? It's about this, okay? So this awareness of this dance that's going on, we have to make decisions about our sexuality, okay? Because this is a time when pregnancy can occur, all right? And so as men and women, we have to make choices, okay? Am I willing to be a parent? Am I ready to do that? If not, you gotta think about this, okay? As guys, you gotta think, is this love or lust? Huh? Are you a man of honor? Because this is, you're asking this woman <clears throat> to take an enormous risk here, all right? And people go, oh, not to worry, hey, the pill. Oh yeah, there's about 40% of cycles where there's breakthrough ovulation, people, all right? You can still get pregnant on the pill. You can get pregnant on depot. You can get pregnant on the patch. You can get pregnant with condoms. Okay, there's no foolproof. Way here, all right? So anyway, <clears throat> men perceive fertility. This is also an issue potentially because if I am, well, let's, let's talk about infertility, which is the second one, all right? This is the work of a man by the name of Lionel Tiger. Yes, his mother named him that. <laughs> the very famous anthropologist who's written a lot of things about men, men's societies. He's got a book called The Decline of Males. And in fact, he wrote a book with another guy whose name was Robin Fox. And yes, his mother also named him that, all right? Lionel Tiger believed that when chemical contraceptives came, you men no longer trusted that if a woman was pregnant, it was your child, that it was possible for her to be having relationships invisibly, okay, because this, this is an invisible kind of, of um, contraception. So he did an experiment. It's been repeated by other people. He took a colony of monkeys out to an island, and there was one male, and his name was Austin. Austin was absolutely faithful to three consorts. He did not pay any attention to the other females until they put those three consorts on chemical contraceptives. He quit having sex with them, and he took up with other consorts. When they put all the females in the community on chemical contraceptives, Austin didn't fare very well. Austin's sperm count dropped like a rock. He no longer had regular intimacy or intercourse with any female, but he raped violently and randomly. And he masturbated excessively. When they took the females off, his sperm count came back. Rape disappeared. He returned to his first three consorts, and masturbation disappeared. Now, I want to say something about that. First off, we know that since 1960, around the world, wherever chemical contraceptives have occurred and are used, male fertility has dropped by half, not only in people, in birds and in fish. And the first research had to do with male fish and male birds in England discovered to have egg sacs. Weird, they're not supposed to have egg sacs. It was about the estrogen in the water. When we women use chemical contraceptives, we pass the estrogen out of our bodies into our water supply. It is a waste management issue around the world. We do not know how to get the estrogen out of the water. It's huge, all right? It's also an issue um, because we know that males are being, born with, are being born with deformed genitalia more than ever before. We know the sperm count issue is down. And we women don't know what all that estrogen is doing to us because while we live in an estrogen environment as women, we know something else about estrogen, and that is that it causes cancer. Too much estrogen is carcinogenic. We have an epidemic of women with different kinds of cancers. What is it related to? We're not sure, but I'm telling you, the estrogen in the water is a very serious issue, okay? Now, this other question here about, about rape. Yeah, it's going on. What about masturbation? Is that a problem in our culture? Heck yes, what's it called? Pornography, it's a huge issue. Sexual addiction. We, you as men, live in environments where multitudes of women do not smell fertile to you, all right? And I believe that there's this monthly dance of fertility that's supposed to be there as men and women, okay? Sexual interest and the whole piece. We need to know that pornography is not sex. Pornography is addiction. The part of the brain in brain scans that's triggered is, oh yeah, where cocaine goes, 
not where sex is. There is no satisfaction stage that is present in normal human intimacy when there's been sexual intimacy that the last phase of satisfaction of calmness and quiet, it's not present with pornography. People have to keep escalating because it's an addiction. And I don't know if you know this, but it's been proven it causes brain damage. It causes shrinkage in the prefrontal cortex. Cortex. If you stop using it, it comes back. But there, there's real visual indications that this is very damaging. As women, we should not tolerate this. It does not enhance our sexual lives. We will never compare to the women that are readily available at the, the flip of a button on the internet, and they make no demands. Really, don't you want to be in relationship with a real human being? You know, we need them to be paying attention. You're never going to look like those women. You can't change that quickly. We need to take a stand on this because people who will use pornography as, in theory, a sexual enhancer have what? More abuse, more divorce, less likely to marry. Children involved may be, may be abused or we'll see the family destroyed. It's a huge issue. This week's issue of Newsweek has an issue on um, the, the front page stories on sexual addiction because pornography is also a gateway to other unfaithful pieces. You know, now I have to go live out my fantasy. This is a huge issue that we have to really be conscious of and make some choices about, okay? So infertility, males perceive that we are not fertile. They're not interested. If my partner is on the pill, I, I'm not getting this cyclic thing. And you know that woman at work? Oh, I don't feel that way about my wife anymore. I must be in love with this other woman. Well, no, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you're just involved in this, this fertility piece. You know, sexually you're really interested in her because your wife is not triggering this in you. Okay? Now, what about pregnancy? Yeah, men are changed by pregnancy. Can you say a little bit about that? Because you guys have suffered, in my opinion, because you are viewed as sperm donors. You are not held accountable to be men of honor. You are not ex have any of this stuff explained to you, all right? And so this question of who am I as a man is a real serious issue, all right? When a pregnancy occurs and he is with his partner, 60 to 80% of men will experience something called kuvad. Now, I will also say to you, this is a footnote, that many times men know we're pregnant before we do because our scent has changed. And they'll say to you, dear, I think you're pregnant, and you're going to go, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, usually he's right. So just take note of that, all right? Kuvad, what does that mean? It means he has symptoms of pregnancy with you. And 20% of these guys are really sick. They really don't feel good. And they go to the doctor, who in our culture has never heard of this, but in primitive cultures, they knew that men would have symptoms with their wives. And when the wife was giving birth in a hut with other women, he was having his own birthing experience, okay? A pseudo sort of birth experience. Transitioning him to fatherhood, all right? In our culture, that doesn't happen. So these 20% who feel really bad go to the doctor and they say something like this. I'm really sick. I'm throwing up a lot. I'm very nauseous. Food makes me crazy. Um, I have back aches and headaches and toothaches. I'm not sleeping well, but I'm really anxious and I'm really tired. And then he sort of mutters to himself, mm -hmm. and I have food cravings, and I've gained weight. <laughs> and the doctor scratches his or her head, because they've never heard of this, and goes, oh, it's a virus. It'll go away. I'll tell you when, all right? But first, the word about these 20%. These guys, all right, when the baby's born, they're hardwired to know the different kind of cries of their child. We women are hardwired through the delivery process. These other fathers learn it. These 20% who are so sick, got it, hardwired. They recognize the difference between tired, hungry, distressed, okay? Now, this question of when does it go away, all right? Six weeks before the baby comes, our father undergoes radical hormonal changes. His testosterone drops like a rock, okay? He's less likely to wander, to be aggressive. His estrogen, because men do have estrogen, <coughs> goes up, okay? 
it makes him kinder and more gentle. This is a point in our pregnancy where we're, we're kind of fragile. We need some extra TLC. Nature is course correcting your bravery as a hunter to become a father now. You get another hormone that's called cortisol. Cortisol is, a, is your stress hormone, but you don't get so much as to be massively stressed. You get enough to be on alert. That's a business about not sleeping well. Cortisol also has to do with protecting, okay? Now, you also get another hormone, it's called vasopressin, predominantly a male hormone, and let me say a word about something else. This concept, this, this information, this lie, that we can be involved in sexual activity without consequence is pure lie. Nobody in the world is able to turn off their brain and their body chemistry when they engage in sexual intimacy. We are hardwired to begin to bond to this partner when we engage in sexual intimacy. We women get one kind of hormone. This is one of the things you guys get, vasopressin. It gives you preference for this female and makes you jealous and protective. Now you can walk away, but if you keep doing that, you're changing your brain. Because I don't know if you guys know this, but your brain does not finish until age 25. From 11, to 25, it's in a state of flux. It is growing and changing and pruning, and the things that you engage in change your brain in a very significant way, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it's sex. Changes your brain, okay? So now, this man gets a lot of vasopressin, and I say, this is mother nature, sit, stay. Don't abandon right now. When the baby comes, our father gets the hormone prolactin. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's the nursing hormone. He gets a lot. It makes him extra kind, tender, and protective of mother and baby, all right? This is a huge issue. Women, write this down. For six weeks, you have the possibility of diapers and Starbucks at midnight. <laughs> then you're gonna have to plan ahead, okay? But this is bonding, this is protecting. Okay, now, when his chemistry goes back up, his testosterone never again goes as high as it was when he was a bachelor. He has enough, but it's not off the chart. Nature said, done with hunting, time to be parent and protector. It's just a difference in role, all right? Now, there's more to this. We know in the animal kingdom where male monkeys care for their offspring, that they get a ton of new brain cells, ton, in the higher functioning part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. And they last until the young become independent. We've not looked at this in humans during the, the pregnancy piece, but we are starting to look at the inner relationship of if the father is with his baby and holding his baby. And oh, guess what? It appears that they're getting new brain cells, okay? This is an incredible dance, okay? of change for both of us, all right? Now, we women are changed by pregnancy, all right? We women carry cells from every child we ever conceive the rest of our lives, or at least for 40 years, okay? Microchimerism, C-H-I-M-E-R-I-S-M. Cells are present throughout our body. They are present as early as five weeks after conception. We can find them in the human body. Could be there sooner. We've not looked sooner than five weeks. We do not know how they pass from mother to child, but they are there and they are very present. And they will be in a number of places in the woman's body. Now, the other thing is, you have cells of your mother's. These pass also. If you're born with an anomaly or you're suffering from a disease, Guess what clusters there? The mother cells, as though they're trying to fix it. The cells of my children may also help me either to heal from disease or cause diseases, all right? Remember what I said about this partner, all right? If this is my partner, those cells appear to be reparative in my body and they try to fix things. 
And when I was at the University of Pennsylvania, there was an oncologist and a cancer expert in the group who raised his hand and said, I have to tell you, I'm doing, I'm doing research with this. And if this is the partner of a woman who has cancer, I will remove her son's cells from her body. Why sons? Because it's obvious. Okay, my, my daughter's cells will be XX. It would take high-tech genetics. I will remove her son's cells and inject them into her tumors. And guess what happens? Oh yeah, the tumors die and disappear with no consequence to the mother. All right? However, if this is my partner, we know that there is, a, there is a direct correlation to an autoimmune disease in women called scleroderma and some others. Why? Because my children to my body's immune system look an awful lot like me. Not quite, but close. There must be something wrong with my body and they launch an attack on my body. In this case, they recognize that they are my offspring cells. You see, for us women, it takes six months of exposure to the seminal fluid of our partner, to, the, to sperm, for our body to say, that is my partner, all right? And I don't know if you guys know this, but sperm are loaded with antigens, the purpose being to have my female body launch make this adaptation in terms of my immune system. And gentlemen, I don't know if you know this, but your sperm and your blood never meet in your body unless there's damage. And if there's damage, or if there's a vasectomy, guess what gets set off in your body? An autoimmune response. You now start responding to your sperm. And even if you fix it, you restore the vasectomy, you still may now have autoimmune issues. Because once they meet, you've set off that in your body, okay? Now, you could get pregnant people before the six months, but it takes this six months for your body to say, that's my partner. So then when I conceive children, my body says, oh, yeah, those are the, the children of my partner, okay? Now, how many of you have older siblings? Raise your hands. You want to know whose cells you carry in your body? Yeah, your older brothers and sisters. Your mom passed them to you during pregnancy. We don't know exactly what their purpose is, but we know they're there. You are free to use the conclusion that my youngest daughter came to when I told her this, which was, she must have gotten the best cells of her older brothers and sisters because she is by far the exceptional child in the family. So you can use that. <clears throat> you can quote her on that, all right? But now, there's more here. So I've talked about sperm. It takes 72 days for sperm to form in a male body. Three, three or four sections, okay? But listen. We thought that sperm never got old, all right? That for men, there's no problem with being an older father. But now there's significant research, and guess what? Sperm ages. And men who are older when they father their children are more likely to have children with autism spectrum disorder diseases, schizophrenia, certain types of heart conditions, predisposition to certain types of cancer, and a couple of odd things. Also Down syndrome, potentially. It isn't only the woman. We, we, there's just so much that we, we don't know that we haven't learned, okay? Now, there are three types of sperm. You will like the titles. They're highly, they're highly technical. Egg-getters, blockers, oops, and killers, all right? Oops. All right? It's the work of a guy in Britain. I think perhaps he played rugby, but I'm not sure. All right? Egg-getters are the ones that we normally think of, the very sleek sperm, okay? Now let me say something about that. I don't know if you guys know this, but your sperm is incapable of entering an egg unless it is changed in the body of your partner. Can't, can't enter. Sperm sits at the base of the fallopian tube for about five hours, undergoes something called capacitation, and now it's possible for the sperm to enter the egg, okay, this acrosome reaction it's called, and the sperm swims differently after this. It swims with more intent to propel it forward up the fallopian tube where it meets the egg, all right? This is interesting because there's another piece to this that I'll talk to you about in a minute. The role of blockers, if you look at pictures of sperm, you'll sometimes see oddly shaped ones and they go, oh, they're just misshapen. No, they have a role, and their role is that the blockers fill in crypts in the cervix so that the egg-getters can get through, okay? They don't get lost. 
Killers are, for the most part, benign. They don't do anything unless I have had multiple partners in a short period of time as a woman. Then the sperm of all these males launches a poisonous attack against the others because it's all about who wins. Okay? And so this can set up a nasty infection in us women, something called bacterial vaginosis. And when that happens, the chemistry of the uterus, which is normally acidic, tips to alkaline. When that happens, the kind of bacteria that grow there are what are called anaerobic bacteria. That's a deadly, that's a very serious infection, okay? Your men bodies are for the most part alkaline. The last thing put on the sperm before it leaves your body is a coating of vitamin C to make it now acidic so it survives in the, in the female body. It's very interesting stuff, okay? Now, I wanna say something else to you. You know that you were told that pot is benign. No problem. You need to know that pot can interfere with your reproductive system as males and females. And the chemistry of pot sits in your fatty tissue for a while, sits there. And the things that get interfered with are this. It's very similar to a naturally occurring um, substance that is necessary to communicate between egg and sperm, the place where the sperm would enter. Well, THC screws that up. It blocks those sites. Also, as this baby is moving down, preparing to lodge in the uterus, guess what it messes with? The signal here that says this is the place that's prepared. And miscarriages may result, all right? It's both the female body and the male body. It's not benign, and we need to be conscious of that. Nobody tells you that stuff. The more I read about this, I thought people have to know this stuff. You've got to make choices and decisions. You don't know what kind of long-term consequences there are here. We know that your sperm, if you've got THC in your body, doesn't, doesn't swim right, okay? And in some cases, it doesn't work right at all. That's something we have to be conscious of, okay? Now, um, I also want to um, erase our boards here again. Nice to have three boards for a change. Otherwise, I'm just erasing, erasing, erasing. Right. We also need to recognize that the chemistry of hormonal contraceptives changes our bodies as women in significant ways. So one, I'm not, I'm not cycling with the other women. Secondly, if I've been on the pill or on Depo-Provera young for a long period of time, there's a real incidence of increased breast cancer. If I'm on Depo-Provera, that's the shot. It demineralizes your bones by 7% a year at the time it should be mineralizing and making them stronger. People are writing about the fact that we may have a serious epidemic of women with osteoporosis at much younger ages because of this demineralization, okay? The other thing that it changes is it changes the mucus in our system which protects us against things like STDs that help the sperm to swim. There's many things going on. If we're teens and we've been on the pill, one of the things that changes is that our cervix, which normally is, is very thick, our cervix is protective of us in terms of infection. There's a, a spot in here when we're teens that isn't finished. It's called the transformation zone. And if I've been on the pill, it makes the transformation zone bigger. And it means that I'm now more likely to contract an STD, okay? Or an STI, whatever we're calling them these days. It's an awareness we need to be conscious of. If you are on the pill, according to Dr. Susan Rackle, who is a psychiatrist who's written a book called No More, no More Periods, The Blessings of the Curse, you are pretty well assured that if you contract human pamplomavirus, it will be the precancerous kind. It will not be the benign kind, all right? Nobody tells us this stuff, people, all right? We need to know that many sexually transmitted diseases are highly infectious and they're contact driven, not sexually, <coughs> sexually driven. If I have herpes, I've got an outbreak, I can pass that to you without sexual contact, okay? If I have HPV, of the 67 some percent of men who are sexually active who have HPV, 37% of them have the virus under their fingernails. Skin to skin contact, pal, gives it right to you. We need to be conscious of these things. 
We need to know that on college campuses, because of oral sex, there is an outbreak of gonorrhea of the throat. It looks like strep, but it's harder to treat. We also need to know that people are now saying to women who have been involved in oral sex, that when you go to see the dentist, you need to ask him to check you for what? Mouth cancer. A serious outbreak caused by HPV from oral sex. We need to know that we can pass these things to our kids. If we have HPV and have a baby, our baby may be war born with warts on its, on its vocal cords. Herpes may pass to our children, okay? We have to make good decisions about this. Many of us contract our first sexually transmitted disease on our first contact, okay? I asked teenagers in high school, do you ask your partner if he's got an STD? I've asked the girls this. Do you, have you asked your partner? Uh-uh. Did you check to see if he's got any lesions or anything? Uh-uh. Why not? I don't know him well enough. I see. <laughs> You're gonna have sex with him potentially contract something that could change your life, could get pregnant, and you don't know him well enough to protect your life? What kind, of, what kind of stuff is that? And you guys, you don't wake up infected one morning, okay? You will contract STDs from some woman, all right? It's about making good choices. There's a wonderful chart in a book called Epidemic by Meg Meeker talking about some of this. And if you have never had a, another sexual partner when you make a choice that this is your life, your life partner and that other person has it, there's zero chance of getting an STD, all right? But in today's world where many of us have had many partners, if you've had 12 partners and your partner's had 12 partners and they've all had 12 partners, one act of intimacy gives you exposure to 4,095 people. Chances that you're gonna get something, yeah, they're pretty good. Um, let me go back to men for just a minute. You know, we think of seminal fluid as a carrier. You know, it's just a carrier, it moves the sperm. But that's wrong, because seminal fluid is an incredibly complex fluid. It's got more than 30 compounds in there, including zinc, which enhances us women in our immune system. It's got different kinds of sugars to help the sperm move. It's got all kinds of chemistry. And on top of that, it's got a ton of hormones. It's got all kinds, 13 different kinds of prostaglandins, which cause little contractions, which is what helps the sperm to move right here. It has follicle stimulating hormone. Oops, that's a woman hormone. Luteinizing hormone. Oops, a woman hormone. Serotonin and dopamine. We women absorb seminal fluid for 15 hours after sexual contact with our partner. Oh, well, we're using condoms, not to worry. I'm telling you, there's always a little leakage. You are still absorbing this material. You are changed by it for the better or for the worse, okay? I mean, it, it's just a question. Do you want your body to be physically changed by this guy? You have to make those decisions because there's all these complications here that you're, you're hearing about. Um, you know, but think about that. If this is my partner, I'm married to this person, he's changing my body in really incredible ways because I'm absorbing all that chemistry and it's changing my brain chemistry. We've tracked, people have tracked this in terms of things like depression and other things. We need to know if we're using chemical contraceptives, guess what one of the things is that chemical contraceptives blow up? Libido, okay? So I'm using the pill so I can be free and sexually active and I lose my interest. Changes my body. So this awareness, again, of choices that we need to make are really an important thing, okay? Now, um, I wanna say a little bit about falling in love, all right? The first stage of falling in love is infatuation. Perhaps you know it. birds are loud and the stars are bright and you can I am and T am all night without any consequences to your thumb. Wonderful, this, oh, this person contacts you 35 times a day. Isn't that romantic? Okay, let me say something about this. The chemistry of infatuation is an amphetamine. It is directly related to OCD. You perhaps have heard of it. Obsessive compulsive disorder. When you're infatuated, you're sort of in an obsessive compulsive state. 
all right? Your brain can't stay in an amphetamine state for that long. And when you're in this state, you are not clearly thinking. You are not objectively thinking about your partner. You're just overwhelmed with how awesome this person is. Now, the good news, bad news is, and there's two different pieces on the bottom end, somewhere between four months and eight months to four years maximum, this disappears. Your brain can't stay in an amphetamine state. It's fried. And now, <clears throat> if this is a long-term relationship, you move to an opiate base, okay, oxytocin-driven, okay, oops, excuse me, oxytocin. This is the stuff of long-term love, people. This is the stuff that bonds you to your partner. This is far more addictive, but it's a much calmer kind of love, okay? If your partner's gone and you're alone, you're restless. You don't eat well. You don't sleep well. Why? Because this, this, this naturally occurring calm chemistry isn't happening. If you see the media people, this is the phase that everybody's in, isn't it? And when you fall out of the passionate, heart-throbbing stage, <laughs> you fell out of love, right? Yeah, you know the love junkies. They go from one relationship to another. But the reality is that this is the movement that you're making in a long-term relationship. When you get over here, you're suddenly more objective about this person. And you know, one of the things you might have concluded, those 30-some contacts a day are stalking. Okay? <laughs> Not about love, it's about control. Again, anthropologists say this isn't the time to make quick sexual choices because you can make mistakes here. You're not able to see this person in a complete and objective sort of way, okay? This gets you hooked, and sex here sounds like a really good idea. But it's again about making choices that are long-term choices in your life, okay? That's an important piece for us to be conscious of. I want to say just um, another thing coming back to this. Babies are in charge of pregnancies, not us. From the moment of conception, the baby is already communicating things to us. We're getting those cells. It's the baby that builds the placenta. If our mother is calorically adequate, okay, she's got enough calories, the baby will build a regular size placenta. If the mother is calorically challenged, the baby will build a bigger placenta to ensure that it gets enough calories as it's growing. If the baby built a regular placenta and now the mother becomes ill or something and there isn't enough calories, the baby will build its brain first. Then we have a small birth weight baby. And there are some very significant research studies on long-term health issues for small, for, um, small birth weight babies, okay? Um, certain types of heart conditions, diabetes, and some other things, all right? But the baby's in charge of this, okay? We live in a society that says, oh, hey, have a C-section. Easy. Yeah, not so easy for the baby. Unless it's a life-threatening event, the baby wasn't ready to be born. It's the baby that triggers birth, okay? Baby triggers birth. Kids who are born with C-sections, as they grow up, have trouble with transitions. Transitions are very hard for them. Birth is a naturally occurring event. The chemistry of birth prepares the baby to enter the world, and the initial close contact with the mother soothes the baby, moves it to oxytocin, which now makes it possible to breastfeed. We are quickly offered drugs. We are offered epidurals. We need to know that epidurals can interfere with the baby's latching ability, which may mean that breastfeeding is going to be difficult. Okay? We need to know that we women used to know how to give birth. And I'm not anti-male, but this will be an anti-male statement. When men not involved in the birthing process, it changed. Because when we women gave birth, we gave birth with women around us. We oftentimes were in a standing position so that gravity helped to deliver the baby. And when men got involved, they said, I don't want to stoop on the ground to catch a baby. So here, dear, lay on this nice hard gurney, put your feet up. You can now push a seven to eight pound baby uphill against gravity. Doesn't that sound like fun? Oh, it hurts. Medicine. The initial medicine we were given was morphine. In animals that pair bond, 
When you give the mother morphine in her first delivery, guess what? She doesn't bond to her babies. And the next generation of females eats their young and the males don't pair bond at all. It changes everything. We don't know what this, some of these things have done to our brain, okay? Um, uh, with the morphine, we also used to give women a hallucinogenic drug, which made us forget labor, and then women would wake up and cry and say, that's not my baby. Where's my baby? Because they weren't present when they, the child was born. But also women would flail, okay, thrash. And so for a while, as women, we were tied down when we gave birth to our babies. That's not how it's supposed to be, people, okay? We have to make good choices about birth as well. And many of you have seen the birthing films that you saw in health class. You're all familiar with it? Blood, screaming, father looking like he's gonna pass out cold. Everybody watching the monitor, not watching the mother, okay? That terrifies us, okay? It really does. That's a sort of a pathological birth model, okay? Birth is designed to be gentle. Birth is designed to be calm. It's designed to bring new life into the world. We women do better birthing if we have a woman with us. Professionally, it's called a doula, but somebody you trust who's just there, it's good for you guys too, because you know what? You've not been in a birthing situation before. In the old days, men were comfortable with birth because they were farmers. They had been with animals giving birth, they knew how to help birth happen, but now we haven't seen birth. And so we're put into this, set, this setting and we're like, Oh my God, what's gonna happen? I don't know, okay? But the reality is that having this calm woman there can make a difference, because she can also say to you, breathe, okay? <laughs> don't pass out, breathe. Um, you know, in the old days, you used to be on your birthing hut, okay? You're not there anymore. You're, you're in the delivery room with your baby and your wife. If you are fathers, when, you're, when, you're, when your wife is pregnant, Read to your baby in utero. There's a wonderful book called Oh Baby, The Places You'll Go by Dr. Seuss to be read in utero, not the college one you all get when you graduate, all right? Babies can hear you very early in the pregnancy. When the baby's born and they hear your voice, men, in the delivery room, they look for you. They make eye contact because they already know who you are. It's really awesome. As women, for us to listen to calm music when we're pregnant, put our feet up, just listen, that music will soothe our baby for 18 months after birth if there's nothing organically wrong. Awesome. It'll also soothe you. Transition to parenthood is a big deal, okay? It's hard work, but it's also some of the most rewarding things that will ever happen to you. But we, again, need to be well-informed. We need to make decisions. We need to know how these things play out in our lives. And so it's my hope that in hearing this, you've learned something you didn't know before. All right? It's about being able to be good consumers. All right? We have to know what we're doing to our bodies as men, as women. If we're contracepting. We have to know what these things are doing to our body. I have to say to you that one of the risks from hormonal contraception, women, is blood clots. You need to be very careful because I will tell you why. My 22-year-old daughter's best friend died last year. Of what? Blood clots caused by the pill, collapsed on the campus, had a huge blood clot in her lung. They tried to save her. She lived for four days. Her parents had to tell her they were going to let her die because there was no way to save her. That shouldn't happen to anybody. If we're on the pill, we ought to be demanding that our doctors check us for the clotting factor. But we need to know that we also might be susceptible. If we smoke, that aggravates it. If you're on the patch, that's higher estrogen. The chances of, it, of blood clots are even higher there. The first people who did research on the pill when it first came out, it was very high test estrogen. It was in Britain. There's a book by Ellen Grant um, written about this. And they had lots of women who died. And what happened when they started to do autopsies was they discovered that these women were filled with itty bitty blood clots. And then they changed the formula of, of the pill to cut back on estrogen. But again, we're, we've increased estrogen amounts in some of the other forms. We need to be conscious of this. I gave this talk at a high school, and, and there was a mom afterwards who came up and said to me, every doctor checks for the blood clotting factor. That is not true. I have one daughter with it and one daughter without it. The one without it is, of course, on the pill. It's in your family, 
and you're willing to take this risk. I'll say, I hope nothing happens. But again, as consumers, we need to know these issues. We need to know as men, we need to protect our partners. We need to have open, real conversations about our intimacy, about who am I and who do I want to be? What life do I want for myself? Because you can make choices, you know? Nice thing about being a human is you can start over tomorrow. Really, okay? We're not, you don't have to be stuck in a loop. You can start fresh and really make other choices about your, about your sexuality, about your life. And really, I encourage you, think about who do you want to be? Where do you want to go? You know, how do you want your life to be lived? Because if we don't think about those things, we find ourselves entering into places that we didn't intend to go. And heartache follows from that, okay? I want to say to you that as college students, if you have a girlfriend, a woman friend who's had an abortion, you need to know that in the six months after the abortion, she's 10 times more likely to attempt to suicide. You watch her and you get her help. And as guys, we don't talk about guys impact here, but I'm telling you, there are guys on college campuses who jump off the bridge or drive, you know, it's suicides, and nobody knows what happened other than a select group of friends who if they really trust you will say, John was involved with Mary, there was a pregnancy, there was an abortion, and he's never been the same. That is a fact, and it is part of your your, your milieu of friends who might walk in these places, please be present to your friends. Please help them to get help because this is a really serious, serious issue. Men who've been involved in abortions get involved in sexual addictions, in chemical addictions, risk-taking behavior. Women may suffer with depression, with chemical dependency, with another pregnancy, with an abusive partner. There's a lot of things that happen. Remember, I never lose those cells in my body. I have biological knowledge. And what happens after an abortion is the fact that this is the normal response of a mother who's lost a child in a traumatic and unnatural fashion. People deal differently with that. But that's the bottom line. This isn't pathology. This is a normal response. And we need to be conscious of that because we can be present to our friends in those moments when they desperately need somebody to, to walk beside them, okay? Now, hopefully this has been helpful for you. You know, my, my reason in sharing this in part is that if I can help you not to go the places that the women and men I help have gone, it's a win. It's a win for you. It's a win for everybody in your life. But also, my prayer and my hope for you is that you're going to be able to make choices that are going to give you the kind of life you want. The person you're going to spend your life with people has to be the person you can trust your life to. What do I mean? You're in a car accident. You're comatose. That person's going to make choices for you. You fall down, you hit your head, you're dying of cancer. That person is the person who's going to walk beside you. And my prayer and my hope is that you marry somebody who will be your best friend, who you will trust with your life, who you will trust to raise your children. Because you know what? When that happens, it's an enormous gift. And it's really about us being able to make choices that lead us to those places. So hopefully this was helpful. I will entertain some questions if you have any. We have a mic over here that may or may not be working. Um, otherwise, I'll be around a little while afterwards if you've got questions. Let me give you my email address because sometimes you leave here and then you've got a question. Or some of you are in biology and you're thinking about something I said and you want to know where I found that. In case you want to know, the book list for this talk is more than 60 books. That's not counting the number of articles, all right? If you write to me, write to me at Vicki, B-I-C-K-I, T-H-O-R-N, 2004, at yahoo.com, all right? I will do my best to answer you or to point you to whatever information you're looking for. Know that if I don't answer you immediately, it doesn't mean I'm not going to, it just means I'm on the road. Because when I'm on the road, I oftentimes do not have access to my internet. I'm out like this, and I don't always have access. But I will do my very best to answer your questions or to point you to the information that you're, you're interested in. So thank you, and if you have questions, if you come up, um, I will entertain them. If you have to leave, you can go.